Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. As we have reported, national health officials have reported that mental health of our students has worsened during COVID. One CDC director says our youth are in crisis. We are so pleased to have with us two educators, local educators to join us. Um, Lucilla Davila and Tamara Ramirez Torres, thank you both for being with us. And tell us a little bit about what do you do in the schools that you're with and how is this impacting your students? So um, let's start with Lucilla. Then. Thank you for having us here today, Jody. Um, you know, the pandemic has caused a huge impact on our students, and I'm gonna speak to the early childhood and elementary components. Like for instance, we have students in second grade who have not had the foundational years. So they've missed all the kindergarten and first grade. So even having the stamina of being in school all day, um, students are kind of um, a little bit restless, and they don't have the stamina to continue reading and doing the math and so forth, or even the stamina of taking a pencil and, and you know, the fine motor skills. So those are things that, between kindergarten and first grade, we, we um, have students master, and now we have to have to have those students master those skills in second grade and still be second graders. Um, and that's the academic component of things. When we talk about also the social emotional component, um, it's socializing amongst peers. And you know, um, here you have students who are sometimes crying because someone or looked at at you know I'll use I will say Johnny because Johnny's my son right um, someone had looked at Johnny some, a certain way and that that um, that look or that um, um, cause maybe a little sentiment uh, to the child right so it's those social skills as well um, and that emotional component of how do we talk to each other how do we socialize because they haven't had any of that stamina or the the foundations of building the social emotional skills with the academic skills so right now the job for a teacher coming in um, and second grade students are it's very difficult in the way that they have to not only master the second grade standards, but they also have to then pick up that gap that has happened between this whole pandemic with our students today. Oh, so tragic. Tamara, tell us about um, the school that you're with. And what you're I work at um, El Colegio High School in, in um, Minneapolis. It's a small charter school. Um, we have um, Latino students, students of color, and um, it's a ninth through 12th grade. And as Lucila said, uh, we're struggling also as well. Um, we're struggling with our 12th graders who are now g ready to graduate, but did not, were not in school since 10th grade, right? So 10th, 11th, and now 12th grade. So it's really hard on them um, to get them ready for college. They have been accepted to college, but they're so afraid of going because they, they lack all of these skills that they missed in two, almost three years of school. And again, it's academic, it's emotional, it's It's emotional, mentally. it's social, um, it's a lot of uh, mental health, a lot of mental health, a lot of depression. Um, it's really hard to get them back into the school. Uh, they they want to they wanna do classes from home, uh, they, but then they don't, um, they're not active. You know, they'll turn on their camera but they're, they're not active in the mm -hmm. class. And so, you know, it's really hard for us as educators to then be able to, to assess them because they're there and they're not there. And so it's been really tough. It's been really tough. Um, a lot of our students also um, had to work during the pandemic. And so that b has become more important to them um, than education. And so trying to bring them back and trying to reel them in and talk to the parents uh, about the, the importance of education. It, it's been really tough. It's, it's been a challenge. What a challenge. What would be some of the things that you have found that have been helpful to help these students? Well, we, we have um, an in-house counselor that has helped a lot. Um, we're a social justice school, so a, a lot of social justice, a lot of community um, engagement, bringing in you know the, the community. Um, I organized three uh, COVID clinics in the school, so we were able to bring the students in and their parents, and um, because also there's a lack of of um, of, of uh, understanding with the community and 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 a lack of trust, oh, right? Wow. And so, opening these small clinics and and bringing in resources from the community is very important, where they they feel safe. 
Well, and, and when you're talking about lack of understanding and trust, also then when you have clinics and doctors speaking their own language too, then at least they feel more comfortable and they can relate. So that's a way to bring them in. That just mm -hmm. the language piece in mm -hmm. itself, Jody. So that's important um, to have um, when we we're talking about the diversity of culture. And what about for the the young ones? What are some of the things that you have found that have been effective, at least helping small effective changes that so, are making a difference? So good question. Um, thank you for that. Um, one of the things that we've done in our school is that um, first and foremost we purchase a machine that's a smart technology machine that's called a Zono machine and um, it kills 99.9 percent .9 of bacteria, virus, even COVID. And we also have some air purifying systems that also address the 99.9% .9 of, of COVID too. So those are things um, institutionally that we did within the building. But as for the, the components of our students, we're really looking and working very strong. We bought a program that's called Second Step. And it's a program that it's all about the social emotional um, well-being of the students. And it has a lot of different puppets and so forth and a lot of different stories about, you know, when, when X amount of students are feeling sad or they're feeling um, f afraid or they, they're not feeling comfortable because this pandemic has caused all of those uncertainty with our students. So therefore, um, through the, the curriculum that we're using uh, that is all social emotional, um, through play, students can express their feelings and we're giving them an outlet to express their feelings um, and putting it on a character, right? Or putting it on a puppet. And through that puppet, we can get a lot of information. So if XYZ student is having a difficult time or is afraid of something or is having uncertainty of just being in school that we could address it in a different way. We also are looking at the resources that our community, you know, the community that, that our school is in, um, is coming into our, our schools and providing, you know, um, discussions and sessions and trainings for our staff so we can best meet the needs of our students as well. And I've been hearing reports that some of those, these um, deficits or these laws, that, that they'll never be made up. Is that correct? I mean, I hate to think I'm always this positive person thinking there can be a solution, there can be a solution or a, something can be done. Well, each grade um, has a set of skills, right? It, this is I always tell people that, that want to know about this. It's, this is like going upstairs, right? Every staircase okay. is a set of, of, of skills. And so kindergarten, you start at the bottom, then you, you have skills in kindergarten, then you step up to first grade, and then you have you're going to um, learn new skills, but you're also going to use your kindergarten skills. So it keeps building up. So when y when you have a ninth grader that that um, that's that's caught in the pandemic, um, he's going to miss out on those tenth grade skills and those eleventh grade skills, right? And all of a sudden we're coming back, and he's a twelfth grader. He got the credits because he was online, but it's not the same no. as when, when you're in, in, in a building with your peers. And so that they're going, they're graduating, they have the credits, they don't have that social emotional piece. They're just not ready. We weren't able to be there to prepare them for what's coming. And so it, it's very uncertain to them, you know, it's very uncertain. A lot of anxiety, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of depression, um, they want to go, but they don't want to go. They don't dare. They want to do it, but they can't. So it's, it's, it's been really tough. It's been really tough. And then we have just one um, therapist that speaks the language. And so it, she it's, there are too many kids. She just can't treat them all. So, you know, it is what it is. We try our best, um, and, and we try to find resources, but, but it's, we just need more. Well, thank you to you and all the educators out there and doing a great job, you know, trying to make, get through all of this. What advice would you have for parents that might be watching that th their, their little one or their teenage um, son or daughter are struggling? Yes, for the little ones, what I would say for parents is that, you know, I understand technology is great and all of that, but they were on technology for so long. Um, so if they can have more social time and interaction with others and their peers, that's going to, that's going to be enormous. Um, so in finding the opportunities to extend from what's happening at the school at the home level too, so that extension of learning doesn't just stop, you know, does not only occur in school, it also 
needs to be extended to the household. So um, it doesn't stop with the educators, I wanted to say. So therefore, how do we bring that wraparound model into the home as well? And I know we're all living busy lives, but between the social components, um, having materials and resources that are authentic for students to, to engage with their families as well, and getting them away a little bit from technology. Yes, there's a moment of technology, but it's important for, for us to put the technology aside because they were two years in technology, and gross in technology, and it's so isolating that all of those other emotional and social skills need to be, to be um, fostered at a deeper level. And talking about mental health and mental illness and so forth, the more secluded you are, the more um, that mental health and the mental illness, even like depression, you would see stronger signs and deeper signs of that. So if we want to engage the students more socially, all of those other components um, tend to dissipate. I'm afraid we're almost out of time, but very quickly. Um, um, just encourage your student, just encourage your child to go to school, to get up, make it a point to get up, go to sleep early, turn off those cell phones. They're, way, they're, they're on their cell phones way too long, and then they can't sleep. Sleep, eating sleep. right, all of that stuff is yes. so important exactly. to all of it. So yes. Again, thank you for what you're doing, and thank you to all the teachers and educators out there. So thank you so much, and, and thank for you. your busy time to take time to be on our show. So thank you. Thank, really you. thank you. It's much. been an honor to be here today. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be back with more right after this. Vision loss is not something that you feel until it happens. Most people lose their vision from diseases like macular degeneration and glaucoma, not at birth. Three million Americans have glaucoma, and half don't even know it. Eleven million people in the United States have macular degeneration. So many eye disorders can be treated if caught early. Make a plan today to get your eyes checked. Visit brightfocus.org to learn more. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Last May, we told you about today's harvest, a free, fresh market. Here's a quick look at this first of its kind market in the country. Hi, my name is Jessica Francis, and I'm the Executive Director of Christian Cupboard Emergency Food Shelf, or CCEFS. We've been growing and changing to meet our community's needs, so we just want to take a couple of minutes and tell you about our programs and how they work. We offer indoor shopping six days a week at our two Today's Harvest markets. At Today's Harvest, you can pick out a one to two day supply of fresh produce, meat, dairy, deli, and bakery items that we receive just that day from local grocery stores. It's a quick and easy shopping trip that can help keep your fridge stocked with fresh grocery items. The items we have available change each day based on what we have received from the local grocery stores, and we restock food throughout the day, so we always have a great selection to offer. We also offer our drive-up service each week on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays, where we provide fresh produce, meat, and dairy. We also provide some personal hygiene items and household supplies like dish soap or toilet paper. With this program, we also provide diapers for families with small children, feminine hygiene items, and pet food. We also have a number of items that you can choose from to add on to the pre-packed boxes of food. These choices can change from week to week, but we try to have a variety of culturally relevant food items and special diet items. You're welcome to use our drive-up services once per week, and you can also shop at either of our Today's Harvest Markets as often as your household needs to keep your fridge stocked with fresh food. You can use our drive-up program, shop at our Today's Harvest Market, or both, whatever works best for you or your family. A few key things to know about our programs. There are no appointments needed, no documents or IDs that you need to bring to receive service. We'll just ask a few simple questions about your household. While the majority of people we serve are from our primary area of Oakdale, Woodbury, and Landfall, our programs are open to anyone who needs them, regardless of where you live. If you don't have access to a vehicle or can't make it to the food shelf when we're open, you can go to our website and request a food delivery, or you can ask someone to pick up food on your behalf. We know that there are a lot of people in our community that are struggling to put healthy food on the table right now. And we just want you to know that we are here to help. For more information about our programs and how they work, please visit our website at ccefs.org. Thank you.
we are very pleased to have back with us Jessica Francis with the Christian Covered Emergency Food Shelf. Thank you for being with us, CCEFS. And um, I always have a tongue twister on that long <laughs> name there. So again, Jessica, great to have you back with us. And that's amazing. It's been a year, a year ago in May, you were here talking about opening up this brand new place. Um, again, why did you guys decide to e even open this facility? Well, you know, when, when COVID hit and we, we saw so many people that uh, needed um, needed help and needed greater access to the fresh fruits and vegetables and milk and, and meat and other items. And we said, you know, what more can we do and how can we make these items more accessible um, and uh, make these available to the community? And so we opened that, that market last year um, and it's, it's different. It's not a food shelf. It's a free fresh food market. Um, and, and so we were, we were really trying to make it a simple and easy way for people to pick up those items. And again, we're saying this is one of the first of its kind that you're aware of in the country, not only in, in the Minnesota and upper Midwest and stuff like that. That's right, yeah. We, we were trying something entirely new, just trying to say, um, what if we opened this, this little market in a, in a strip mall location and made it open six days a week um, for people to shop and pick out items that we rescue that morning from local grocery stores. So it was it was something that we were trying out and we really didn't know what to expect and we were just overwhelmed with the response. We saw a little bit in the video and as you were talking a little bit about the process, but how does this market work? Right, so um, every morning we have our truck drivers and our volunteers go out and, and pick up food from local grocery stores and, and stores and and pick up items that are that are good. Um, they're they're great. They're fresh produce, milk, dairy, bread, bakery items. Um, but they're towards the end of their life, so the grocery stores are taking them off the shelf um, and and getting ready to put new items on. And so we pick those items up. We display them um, in in our store. That's beautiful too. Yes. And and we and we try to make it feel as much like a like a store as possible. Um, and just make it a really um, respectful and, and um, easy experience for folks. Um, and, and so when you walk into our market, you're handed a shopping cart and you can pick out your items. Um, there's no formal intake process. Um, just at the end, you'll check out on an iPad, answer a few questions on an iPad, um, and you can, you can head out. Tell us about the, the, your customers, the, who's, who's coming in and, and um, you know, just the whole, how has it changed since you were here a year ago talking about opening this up? That's right. Um, so we, we had really expected that we would be seeing about 80 to 100 um, shoppers a day or families a day um, at that market. And we're now serving between 250 and 300 a day just at that first market. Um, and so what we're finding is that so many people that really need that, that food and need greater access to those, those items that are usually the more expensive items mm -hmm. at the grocery store. Um, and, and so they need those greater access to them, but they might be uncomfortable going to a food shelf. Um, and, and so that's a difficult thing for them. Or food shelf hours or, or policies might might make it difficult for them. And so they're more comfortable coming to today's harvest. Um, and so we've just found uh, that it's really meeting that gap and, and, and serving a lot of people that really need that, read the, need that access, but we're not being met with the current um, system. And again, your hours or days of the week and things that you're open, you said the first, you have a second place. That's right, yep. <laughs> so, um, so we now have two markets um, and they're both open Monday through Friday, noon to six, and then on Saturdays from 10 to one. Um, and so that the response was just so strong to that first market that we just opened our second market in March. That is wonderful. And this is one of several programs that you have as CCEFS and very quickly kind of tell us about the other programs that you offer. Then. Yeah, so we, um, we still retain our traditional food shelf um, model. Um, it's still provided in drive up service. Um, so people can drive up and receive the, the traditional food shelf items. Um, so that, that includes still the, the fresh fruits and vegetables and milk and meat and, 
and um, dairy items, but it also has things like diapers and feminine hygiene wow. items and, and household items like dish soap and, and toilet paper. So people um, can drive up and receive those services. Um, and then we have our mobile food shelf that takes basically all of those items I just mentioned from the uh, drive up services and we pack them onto the truck and bring them to different communities that might lack transportation. And this is you bring it to different schools or um, senior living places and things like that, this mobile? Right, truck? so we bring it to six different senior living facilities and then two different um, mobile home courts. And so um, our mobile food shelf really looks to, to meet those needs for, for folks that might have trouble um, getting to our food shelf. What a great success story. And you think of this has all happened during COVID, two years of this uh, pandemic, and you've been able to help so many hundreds of families and individuals. It's got to be so rewarding for the organization to be able to reach the community in that way. Um, final co comments that you might have about that people should know about today's harvest, about CCEFS, and yeah, just that um, you know, especially with the rising food costs, um, so many people are are needing our help. So we we're happy to be helping as many families as we are, but we need help too with volunteers. It takes over a hundred volunteers every week to to put on our today's harvest markets. Um, so. So whether uh, or not you want to make a donation or volunteer or support um, our work, um, you know we we uh, need that need that help from the community to to keep up with the demand. Well, thank you for coming back on Inside Healthcare and giving us an update on how well things are going. That is wonderful. That really is wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. We'll be back with more right after this. Uh, what do we do? You may not be able to plan ahead for a ghost encounter. Under the dining table now! But you can plan ahead for natural disasters. Sign up for local weather and emergency alerts. Maybe it's the apocalypse. Know your evacuation routes and decide on a safe emergency meeting location. Here? I know. What a big Orlando. Protecting your family is the best plan you can make. So pass the Proton Pack to the next generation and visit ready.gov slash plan to get started. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Almost daily, more Americans are being diagnosed with the latest variant of COVID. Well, local doctors say that your symptoms might not be COVID or even the flu. It might be Lyme disease. We talked with a local doctor about knowing the early warning signs and symptoms of Lyme disease and what you can do to prevent it. I think the, the, the important thing to remember about living in Minnesota and you know Western Wisconsin is that we're in a Lyme endemic area, so it's common. Uh, Lyme's disease is the most commonly reported tick-borne illness in the U.S., um, and we're getting into that time of the year where people are going to be outside, coming into contact with uh, ticks, and very likely being exposed to Lyme disease uh, and the the spirochete that actually causes the illness. The challenge, of course, is there is so much overlap in our immune response that generates symptoms related to the infection uh, that are similar to other conditions that are currently prevalent. Uh, certainly, as we've all read and seen in the news recently, this most recent wave of COVID, the BA2 variant, is making its presence known, and we've seen an uptick in cases. Um, fortunately, we're essentially in Minnesota, according to the CDC's influenza map, pretty much not seeing active influenza in the state of Minnesota currently, sporadic cases here and there. But there are other viral illnesses, strep throat, um, conditions that cause a lot of the same symptoms of sort of fever and fatigue, malaise, where you just don't feel good. Um, and so until uh, or unless you develop the, the rash that most people get with Lyme disease, this erythema erith er chronica migrans, or some people call it the bullseye rash, um, it may not be clear what your symptoms are from until you get tested. Um, but we have to keep that thought of Lyme's disease increasingly in the forefront of our minds as clinicians and certainly as patients 
as we, you know, as these warm summer days, not summer days, but these spring days and extending into the summer days um, come before us because we're going to be exposed. Um, and those common symptoms, again, you were saying being fatigue. Yeah, and fever, fatigue, fever. malaise. Um, you, don't, you don't tend to get the same overlap of like respiratory symptoms with the Lyme disease as you do with influenza, COVID, um, and other upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. Um, and so the, the fever, fatigue, malaise may be the very first inkling of, you know, the fact that you have Lyme disease. And then it's the rash. And then if it goes beyond the rash where you don't get um, seen for that rash, um, then you might have some of the later stage symptoms of Lyme's disease that will make it even harder for us to sort out that indeed it is Lyme. Uh, because the symptoms are really vague. You know, they can be joint aches. Um, it can be numbness and tingling in your extremities or weakness if you have neural uh, involvement, you know, involvement of the nervous system. Um, things can be as vague as cognitive impairment. You know, your thinking isn't as clear or your memory is more troubled. Um, it can be really hard to diagnose Lyme disease in that late stage if you don't provide a history or you don't of a tick bite or you don't think of it as a potential uh, contributor to the patient's presentation. And so um, the later stage presentations do get harder to diagnose. Oh, and the test, is, is that a simple blood test that you can get that can be detected? Yeah, so, uh, you know, our approach, to, our approach to Lyme disease is we don't test the overwhelming majority of people who we think have Lyme because you put the clinical scenario together, right? Somebody who comes in and either has seen that they had a tick bite or recalls a tick bite or comes in with this classic rash. Again, you know, 80% of people have the rash. And so you can rely pretty heavily on the clinical scenario to provide you with um, clues that you need to treat somebody for Lyme disease. In those individuals who don't recall tick exposure, didn't have the rash or the rash came and went, um, there are tests that we do and the challenge, of course, with the testing is the results you get and your ability to interpret them correctly really depends on when you get the testing done. So we don't typically recommend someone who's had a tick bite in the first couple of days that they come in and get tested for Lyme because the testing that we do relies on an antibody response by your immune system, which may take several weeks actually to, to manifest itself um, in detectable levels of change uh, that we're looking for in the blood and the blood work. So there are blood tests that we do. Well, that's our program for you. Thanks for joining us. Join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.